Sego, and welcome to Resistance Radio. I'm John Kane, and joining me is my uh, good friend, uh, Dagarundege, otherwise known as Paul Delaron. Uh, Got to get both names out there so people who may not be familiar with, uh, with his Mohawk name will, will understand it. Um, look, we're going we're gonna to talk about this book launch that, uh, that both of us are participating in uh, coming up on, on May 2nd in New York City. It's at Judson Church uh, down near Washington Square Park. Um, for me, it's the first time I'll, I'll have gone to New York since COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic swept through New York City. And it's been a while since you've been in New York as well, isn't it? I think it was 1784. <laughs> you didn't sell the place, did you? No. Okay. <laughs> Somebody beat me to it. <laughs> well, we're, in a way, we're going to be selling something. We're, we're, we're going to New York to do this book launch of um, the, uh, the Mohawk Warrior Society, a handbook on sovereignty and survival. It is, um, you know, the, the book is primarily based on so much of the work and the writing of uh, Louis Hall, who is known as Garun Yaktaje, uh, somebody who was, he really played a, a big role in helping shape the young guys that you, you know, kind of grew up with. And, and it essentially would become this, what would be known as the Mohawk Warrior Society. And, and this notion of um, establishing, re-establishing our obligations to to defend our sovereignty and our autonomy, not just in Mohawk territory, but frankly, it's a movement that I would argue is was bigger than you know what many people recognize as AIM. But this was a bigger movement, and it was a movement based on. It wasn't even a movement. It was it was about reasserting something that um, you know, frankly. Uh, was in our culture, yeah, and it wasn't about trying to start a new movement. It was about, as we we talk about, we're removing the dust and picking up the responsibilities that we had. Uh, but if if you would, I mean, talk to me a little bit, because um, I know, uh, although I participated in a in a piece in this book, you, um, I know that you talked to to some of these guys uh, who who worked on this thing probably more than I did. Uh, give me your your thoughts on um, how the book came to be. Uh, and, you know, look, the other thing is, is how it, how it was put together in a way that we could support, because we've had people write about us yeah. all these years and, and it hasn't always gone well. Um, but talk to me a little bit about how, about how this worked out. Well, it, it came about, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of strange. Um, Sangoyeta, who passed away a while back. Uh, he had asked me to come to Akwizastan, to the Longhouse. That, uh, there were people from New York that were there. Uh, one of the guys' name was Matt, and uh, I can't remember. Malik. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Matt, can't, Malik, and those yeah, guys, yeah. I, I can't remember all their names, but <clears throat> they were doing a documentary, and it was about some of the stuff that was going on in Palestine, and then some of the things that was going on out west with the Lakota people, and uh, they wanted to do uh, a part of it, a third of it, on uh, we as uh, Rudy Noshuni. And so, so uh, we did this documentary, and uh, apparently it came out pretty good, you know. And uh, they started; work, they were already in contact with people in Montreal. And one of them was this uh, Philip. I always forget his last name. Yeah. And that, but uh, he's the he's the author of the book, and uh, he was around us for uh, for a while. And you know, he was very curious, and he wanted to hear from us. You know, he didn't want you know he didn't want to just go by anthropological work or historical uh, that that uh, is there for everybody but it's always somebody's interpretation and so on. Uh, but he wanted to hear from us. And I guess he'd heard a lot uh, from the people as they spoke of Garun Yaktaja and Garun Yaktaja's influence on so many of our people, not just uh, in our community, but all the way you know, across uh, Turtle Island. And a lot of the things that he was, um, um, you know, uh, exposing, 
uh, also went to the non-natives and they started to become really aware of things and so from that came a lot of people who uh, at that time we didn't know we had so many friends and people just came out of the work work and or, or form organizations like uh, RAIN, Rights for American Indians now, who were very instrumental in helping to raise support in uh, the occupation, what people called uh, Eagle Bay, Moss Lake, Ganyaga Indian Project, and that. But there were a lot of people who came forward and really, you know, put a lot into it. And this Philip, these are the things, you know, we talked about and that. And so uh, he asked if he could record what we were saying. And, you know, and he, he put it to us that, you know, maybe we can make write a book about this stuff and that. And so the thing he did was he spoke to us and he listened to us. And he put our words down. He didn't put his words down. You know, and we used a lot of the language and expressing to him what the language really means. Uh, we didn't interpret language. We explained in, uh, the spirit of what our language was, uh, what it means, and so on. And, you know, and he, he really was um, impressed by all of this stuff. And he worked for eight years, I think it is, just uh, traveling around and... Uh, meeting people, I mean, uh, he met people from right across Confederacy and that, and, you know, and I was, I was glad, you know, like people like yourself, John, and Ross, and uh, Gaguira Guerrero, and uh, Francis, and Laurent, all these different peoples, and that, who, who have been people who've been basically in the movement, and that, I won't say the struggle, it was some, always a movement, and we shared with him that there was a time when Rodiscaraguete were not active. And we explained how we came to become active again. And that, that we were learning and, you know, even as far as even our songs and our dances and, you know, and so many different things we were learning. And um, at one point, when we started, we went to the council and we asked them to sanction us. And they said, no. And we said, what do you mean no? You teach us all these things and now you say no? They says, we don't have that authority or that right. And that they says, that's already been prescribed in Guyana Goa. It's about responsibility. And you have to start carrying out your responsibilities. We don't tell you what to do. You know, we just, you know, we work with you, we listen to you, and we'll help you, you know, in whatever way we can. And, you know, at that time, I mean, I was a teenager back then, you know, and I always was amazed because these older ones who shared their knowledge with us gave us everything they could so that we can help ourselves. And the thing I always liked about them was they never told us what to do. It's like they gave us a toolbox with every tool you can think of. Now it was up to us to go to work. And that, you know, and you know, they weren't the kind of guys that oh, move aside, you don't know what you're doing. No, they let us make the mistakes. They let us learn as much as we could on our own and start to use our own minds and, you know, and stress to us the importance that you know, we got to work with our people and that. But they also t uh, explained to us about, hey, listen, uh, you know, you're such a small group right now. And, uh, and you're, you're fighting a, a war that is, is even, it's even harder than if it was a military war. He says, you're fighting, um, what they, how did they word that? Uh, uh, a psychological war. And, uh, and so, you know, they told us, it says, you know, you're only a few, but they wanted to inspire us. So they told us stories of what our people had done, what our people were involved in, you know, in such things as the War of 1812, the Revolutionary War, you know, all of these different struggles that happened here on this land and what our involvement was in it and how 
uh, our grandfathers and our grandmothers played such a, a great role in all of this. And they inspired us. And so we took that. And this is why we were able to do the things we did. We, we listened to the people. And, uh, you know, and the people told us what they wanted. And so we, put, we would put our minds together and we approached them and said, this is what we came up with. And, you know, and as soon as the women supported us, we knew. We knew now we can do it, you know. And even though people would say, oh, it was a Rudis Corregeta project. No, it was a people's concern. And Rudis Corregeta, we just acted on it. And, uh, and we tried to make it a reality. And, uh, and this is why, you know, after, you know, our, a big struggle up in near Montreal, and then uh, we go to Adirondack Park and we, we took land and we reestablished a new community. And, you know, it's 50 years ago. And that community still exists, you know, and, uh, and I think it's going to be here a long time. It's going to go through, you know, good times and bad times. Just all, all of our communities. All of our yeah. communities. We're going to go through that. And, you know, and I don't think we should be so critical of mistakes that were made. But we should praise the people that are continuing to do this, that, that they're actually working, trying to make it happen to the best of their ability. And it's been a real hard, it's been a conflict, not so much with the outside, but we have the biggest conflict inside. Well, and, and to that point, you know, when, when you guys were first organizing yeah. and, and not even knowing where you were going with the organization other than realizing that you had a, commi a commitment and an obligation to yeah. your community, to the nation or whatever, yeah. you had people then encouraging you. That's right. But as years would go on, as the rise of, of both tribal councils and, and these, you know, even the so-called traditional councils that started to become really full of themselves, yeah. we found that that support and that encouragement and that empowerment wasn't coming from those so-called leaders anymore. No. And so when you talk about the conflicts that we were having within, this is after, you know, having a, a good run with, with people who were all about empowering young people, which is what we still talk yeah. about today. Yeah. But we're still the minority. We yeah. still have those powers that be who sit, you know, in these tribal councils or even in these longhouses sometimes with their lawyers that are trying to, you know, develop policies that are about really empowering them yeah. and not necessarily about empowering the people and certainly not about reasserting some of our, our you know, original messages and, and, you know, and those original instructions. So I, I, you know, I think it's yeah. important that people realize what we're, what we're talking about when we go from a place of being empowered by the generation before us to getting into a place where all of a sudden we're, we're, being, we're having to fight some yeah. of those people, uh, not those same people, but the yeah. people who would yeah. be, be, rise into those positions of so-called leadership. See, and this is why we keep telling the people, in our own ways, our original ways, we didn't have leaders. If there was anything that was to be referred to as a leader, it was our system, our people, the voice of the people, the wish and the will of the people in accordance with our ways. And all of a sudden, you know, we have these councils who call themselves leaders. And, uh, and they, they say they represent us. And, uh, but, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a kid. Nobody ever asked me uh, from any of these councils what I thought. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't ask my wife. They didn't ask my children. They don't ask the people that I know, all the people I've met. They've been trying to tell us what we're going to do. They're, gonna, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to force us. And the thing is, I keep looking at them. And I keep asking myself, what is it that you do? What have you accomplished? You know, the thing is, you criticized us. You know, you criticized us and so on. And the thing is, all the symbols that we have, all those things that mean something to us, you're using it as sort of like uh, when you fix a stage. You know, you put these different, I forget what. The, props. Props. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're using them as props. And, you know, everybody, where you turn, they're, they're flying the Ayahuasca belt. And I'm saying to myself, do you people even know what you're doing? You're, you're imposing a system 
on our people that has nothing to do with that Anuata belt. But yet you're trying to justify that you're following our ways because you waved that flag. You know, and, uh, and sometimes I have to say, you know, it's like sometimes uh, some of the men really, I get kind of disgusted. They all want a tattoo of this. They all want to wear a t-shirt of this. Bumper stickers. Bumper stickers. But when it's time to do man's work, they're not there. They're not there to defend our our jurisdiction. They're not there to defend our people. And you know, and you know, there's this big criminalization of our, our of our people, and that because we defy the the so-called chiefs or we defy the clan, uh, not the clan, um, the tribal, tribal council or band yeah. council, and that we're criminalized. Well, and, and and again, let me back up a little bit because you know you you talk about um, how these people. And end up being in these positions, and and you know, and we talk, you know, within within our culture, we we even pitched some of this to to the to the white men about yeah. this idea that no, these aren't these leaders; these are servants. Yes, they've right. been placed in the service of their people. So now it's a common thing for people to say, "Well, I'm a public servant." But if you're a public servant, if you got elected and it's like winning the lottery, then you're not in public service; you're no. in self service. Yeah, and. Yeah, and so you know, I, I try to remind people, even even in Seneca territory and other territories, even though the systems I don't necessarily support these elected systems, I say, look, you're in this position, in a position of service to your people. You know, don't promote yourself as 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 the leader because that's not what you were elected for. You know, and that's and even you know these, these guys who are supposedly put up uh, as these title holders, they're not put up. To be the leaders among men or women, they're they're put they're put in these positions for some very specific, supposedly for some very specific skill sets in helping to bring people together. See, and in, in our language, we say "oyukiwonagaradatse." They will raise our words. Those guys are supposed to raise our words. They're supposed to express what is the opinion of their families, not their opinion. Mm -hmm. They're, up, you know, when 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 they get put in that position, and that the people trust them, and that that they'll they'll do it right. But the thing is, like now, it's not even the people that puts them in. You know, the people don't put them in. These guys put each other in. You know, and they're even now men are appointing clan mothers. I mean, where are we going? You know, well, and and let's 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 talk about. Where the real empowerment comes from. Yeah. The empowerment comes from the state, the yes. province, the the Canadian government, and the federal government. That's right. You, we see this battle playing out in Cuyuba yeah. territory, and it's all about federal recognition. That's it isn't right. about who the people recognize. So, and, and in every one of these situations, especially on the Canadian side with these band councils, they have been so municipalized that they are really extensions of the Canadian government. And there's no question, but they're funded right. that way. They're 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 given their their uh, orders in terms of how right. the structure is, and on the U.S. side. It's it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but it's still heavily influenced by by state and federal uh, policies, and, and and there there isn't. I mean, even when we have you know some of these people talk about decolonization, they're not talking about ripping away some of those systems and yeah. and existing outside of them. They're yeah. still trying to use the system, and you know, and I and I've talked about that on you know on many shows about the the difference between. Um, be, between finding comfortable places within those systems of oppression that you can think you can, you know, somehow advance your people, and uh, which which really isn't true, and and the difference is that can you can you separate yourself? And so when we talk about things like Gunyonga and taking land back, or 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 any of these efforts where we see a, a real true sovereignty movement, which really got its got its legs as we became known. Um, it, this movement that you talked about it became known as the as the warrior societies. Yeah, and that's you know, and and the book that we're launching here on the second is is based on a lot of the writings of of, of Louis Hall. I mean, he actually wrote the the Warrior Handbook, and that's kind of you know part of the title, I guess, yeah. in a way. But Louis, when you talk about how he influenced so many people, he was handwriting and hand typing these newsletters for years. I don't know even know where he got his mailing list from. I know that you you guys in the community supported Louis's work and made sure he had the, the adequate, you know, not only the reading material, I mean, he had a great library, um, but you made sure he had the resources to send out those those newsletters. And, and I know people who collected 
you know, volumes of yeah. these things. I mean, I don't even know if we have a complete set of those any place. It would it'd be hard to, to really wrap your arms all the way around it. Well, we have it. We have it in that. And um, <clears throat> I like to go back to when Louis started writing. He wrote a, a, in a local paper which in Gatanawaga called the Longhouse News. Okay. Him and another man by the name of Peter Diom. And, uh, and these two men were, uh, you know, were very intelligent men. And these men um, dissected things. They dissected ideas they, uh, and that, and um, they, they did a lot of research. I mean, they went through, uh, you know, the history of other peoples in, in other parts of the world, uh, their history. They went into the history of religion. They went into everything, you know. They, you know, they explored ideas about economics and so on and so forth. And they used to try to expose to the people what was happening to them. You know, it's like the people, people seem to have amnesia. They would forget about recent events that were very critical to what's happening to us today. And, and they tried to enlighten people on that. But the thing is that, uh, you know, um, the church was greatly responsible for attacking these two men and, uh, and trying to discredit these two men. And, uh, but, you know, even as a young fellow, I was sitting there and I would see people, theologians and all big, big wigs come down and try to debate these guys. And nobody could hold a candle to these guys. You know, uh, in fact, I, I've seen like um, people who were high up in the church, like uh, cardinals and bishops or whatever the hell they are, and walk out with their tail between their legs because these men knew more about those religions and their history than these guys did. And I, I've met Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, uh, all different denominations, and you used to come you know, to Ganoaga, and they came to Ganyaga to talk with Louis. And Louis would explain all kinds of things. And, you know, I mean, even uh, a man whose name was so big, Dr. John Regeer, he was so impressed. And, uh, and even though he was so high up in the World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches, State Council of Churches, he, Louis Hall blew his mind because he knew more about this whole thing than he did. And he's supposed to be the head of this, you know. Mm. So, you know, and he didn't just represent Methodists, but it was Presbyterians and Lutherans, Anglicans, Baptists, you name it. Everybody was part of that you know, world council, national mm. councils, state councils. And, that, and I mean, he, he impressed these people, but these people's ears were open. And that... But prior to that, you know, like in Ganawaga, I mean, um, you know, the, the, the priests and the nuns used to encourage the kids who went to Catholic school to beat up on anybody who wasn't a Catholic. And, uh, and I mean, times were very hard. There was people who were actually long horse people but sent their kids to a Catholic school because they were afraid of their kids getting beat up, you know, because... They were encouraged to beat up the kids. Well, and, and there was, you know, a pretty good period of time that, you know, that the Longhouse was considered almost an underground kind of movement. It, it in, was. In Gunawaga. Yeah, yeah, it was an underground. And uh, and the thing is that if we tried to hold ceremony, uh, we got raided just like it was a big drug bust. Our RCMP would come running in, and if they could catch the kids, they would t send them off to a residential school. And any of the parents they got, they'd send them off to jail. And uh, so, you know, people come but, home. But that ended up having you know, a backlash within the community because the, the, the strange thing was that, and, and I read about this and, and I talked to people in Gunawagi specifically, you know, even my own father, who was not a part of the Longhouse, he was a part of the Catholics. He, yeah. he said he and others, they would, uh, they would walk over close to the Longhouse. They yeah. listen to the, to the songs and the, yeah. and, and, if, and if you walked out that Longhouse, you'd see all these lit cigarette yeah. <laughs> embers yeah. from the, the people. And these are all the Christians yes. that wouldn't come into Longhouse, but they would send their kids there. That's right. And so there was, you could see that change and that change meant that that next generation was going to, was not going to be as apprehensive to go. Yeah. And, and this is all happening during, during this time that, 
ends up beginning this again this this resurgence of uh, the Rodi get the, uh, the the warrior society and that kind of stuff. You know, it's a strange thing. When I was a kid, and uh, as a longhouse boy, I had I always had to fight, and uh, because I was a longhouse person, and you know, um, I didn't grow up learning English right away. I went to school, and when I went to school, I knew some English words, but um, us little kids, we'd be running around the school, and all of a sudden, somebody would stomp in front of me with his fist made, and he's, he wants to fight me. And I really don't know why, and he says to me, you think you're good because you're a longhouse? I had no clue what longhouse meant. <laughs> you know, I know I went to Gohun Cessna, yeah. but I didn't know the term longhouse. That's but funny. it didn't sound good. So I would fight, you know, but it took a while, you know, to learn uh, better English and start to understand what people were saying. But, but it's interesting because, you know, if you break that down psychologically, they felt like they were inferior in a way because they knew that you had yeah. more of an identity as far as a native identity than they did because, and they, that's what they were fighting you over. Yeah. And, and so when they say you think you're good because you're a longhouse, they knew that you were that you had in as a part of your identity something that was much better defined than what they had, and they had to be uncomfortable with the identities that they were carrying to to even act out this way. And and I think that a lot of it was because uh, some of our families were very strong that we never let the language die, and that and we were forbidden to speak uh, English or French or anything. In our home, we had to only speak our language. And my grandmother would say, see that door? When you pass through that door, you can learn any language you want. But while you're in here, this is the home of Ungwa Hunwe, and you're gonna speak Ungwa Hunwe now. And, uh, and so we were forbidden to say even yes or no in English. And, uh, and so, you know, this is how, by her being so serious about this, we maintained the language, you know? And because when the seaway passed, and that, uh, so many people weren't speaking the language to their children, and that uh, I was. Well, and, and, well, explain that. What happened is they they built the seaway through Gunawagi yeah, because the yeah. St. Lawrence was was the river there. So when the when you say it passed, it, there was literally this this land grab. Yeah, to, they, uh, they to take to take they just this major part stole of the land. the people's land. They dynamited their homes. They burnt their houses if they refused, and so on, and that so. And it was hard because at that time, you know, our people were such an oppressed people. Um, you know, they tried to fight back, but our communities weren't that big then. You know, and uh, and people started to hear more about us when the '70s came around, and uh, because now uh, we were we started to have numbers, mm -hmm. and now we had the ability to do things that disrupted the outside's way of life. And, that, and we, it caught their attention. And the media and everybody got on it. Sure, again, we were always being painted with the ugly brush, but the thing is, we were, we were committed. We stayed true to it. And, and, you know, we did a lot of things, and this is why we got a reputation. Oh, the warriors just like, they're just militants. They're just this, they're just that. But the thing is, people don't understand, we were never the aggressors. We were always defenders. And that, and you know, even to this day, we're still defenders. Well, and and the thing is, and, and I, in in the small, my small contribution to the book, I talk about the fact that these warriors were fathers and grandfathers. Mm. They were lacrosse players. They were iron workers. Yeah. They were farmers. They were. Yeah. They weren't. This wasn't a profession. No. And and to the extent that that there became a time where where there was much more organization and it and it. And it worked into some of the, even the financial systems in Gunawage. So things were able to be funded and that kind of stuff. So you did have people that were, you know, that were, you know, essentially manning a radio more so than, than just, you know, yeah. listening for, for where the next, you know, issue was. But, but no, I mean, it, this wasn't a, a military. No. It wasn't an army. It no. Was, it was people of the community who we, knew we, they had this obligation. We were, we were families. Yeah. We were families. And we were looking out for our people. We were looking out for our children. I mean, drugs, drugs became a big problem. And everybody was at a loss of how, how do we stop this? And, uh, and finally they came and they asked us. 
And so while they're still trying to figure out what to do, we knew what to do. We went to the drug dealers and we told them to stop. And we said, this is your only warning. That's it, you know? And all of them closed down except for two. And so when they continued to sell, the people came to us and said, what do we do? We told them, it's not our decision. It's yours. It's your, you're the mothers. You're, you're the people of this community. You tell us what you want to do. The people met for three or four days, dragged this issue around. They finally decided, banish them. And so when the banishment word came, we carried it out. Well, and I think it's important to understand a little bit of geography here. You talk about Ganawage, and you've got this massive city, yeah. you know, in the in the background in Montreal, which has all kinds of you know social uh, structures. Uh, some of them that are some downright antisocial. You have organized crime in that That's city, right. and then you have the connection from from Montreal and all of those organized crime families and, and ethnicities that are still connected to New York City, which is just, right. you know, it's a farther bit to the south, but but our people were already making some of those trips to New York, you know, working high steel and that kind of stuff. So, so we have a community that has this flow of traffic. I mean, obviously you go to Montreal to go to Toronto, you go, you, 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 yeah. you go through, so this Mohawk territory, has all of these influences and all of these, you know, the, this traffic flow at, at or about. And then some of the, the more criminal element out there realize that, you know, look, we can somewhat support these guys and their, their autonomy because we can use it. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of this stuff, like, the, like drugs and some of the other stuff that was happening in our territory, it was because of the location and, and, and its proximity to these, to these other really... Um, negatively influencing you know, uh, cities and urban areas around us. You know, I mean, I think we 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 uh, we captured more drug dealers and that than the, the police, uh, local police, the provincial police, RCMP. We caught more of them, and and we do the, all the work, and that, then we just turn them over to them. We say these are your people. Yeah, these are the crimes if they commit it. Now do something about it. I remember being being in Gunawage, uh I don't remember exactly why I was there at that time, but I, one of the things that was happening because there there started to be uh, the building of the tobacco uh, trade was, yeah. was happening there, and we were getting these people who come in that were passing counterfeit bills, oh, and, yeah. and how quickly our guys were organized to identify a vehicle, stop a vehicle, and then and grab somebody before they got off the yeah. territory. Oh yeah, and that's the kind of stuff we were we, we were you know being victims of the crimes that were committed outside, like counterfeiting and drugs and stuff. And and then we would have to deal with it inside. So I I, I remember one one time in particular, uh, you know, somebody getting somebody getting stopped by the men for passing counterfeit bills. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, uh, the uh, the police, everybody knew this was going on, but they could never catch who it was. Well, you just got to wonder sometimes how much they wanted to either. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you know, and I see the same thing in a lot of Native territories. If drugs come onto a territory, is that really a big concern for the for the police? I mean, they would rather have it here than than in their neighborhoods. Yeah. And, you know, I look at how the opioid um, and the uh, the fentanyl and all of this uh, this these opioid. Um, problems once it became a white person's problem and it was into the white communities all of a sudden it's a crisis and and we need treatment and we need this and we need that when it was just when when all the stuff was coming through our territories it was just a criminal activity yeah and we, we were all criminals and drug abusers and once it was white you know you know, white kids girls and boys that were not only overdosing but becoming addicted to this thing now it was it was a disease it was an addiction and that kind of stuff we see how the how it changes depending on who is, you know, who are, is being victimized by yeah. this stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of things, a lot of things have been happening. And, you know, and our people, you know, our people are being prevented from ever being able to develop on our own, on our own terms. And uh, every time we try to do something, to, uh, and that uh, we're criminals. You know, it's like this cannabis industry, okay? And uh, our people do it because we know we have the right to do it. But the outside criminalizes it, 
it's no more, it's no longer criminal if they say it's okay. You know, it's just like alcohol. I mean, well, especially on the Canadian side, yeah. you know, Canada is really trying to criminalize the native cannabis shops. We, we, we still haven't gotten there here on the mm -hmm. U.S. side here in Seneca territory. There's, there's pretty much been a hands-off policy, but what happened on the Canadian side is you not only have the Canadian authorities, now you have the tribal councils that get right involved right. in prosecuting their own people for, mm -hmm. because there and, are and, people and realizing now, that it's a now, right. Now, the, the right now these tribal councils and bank councils are saying, well, if we give you a license, then you're legal. Yeah. I mean, what's the difference? Their signature or not their signature? And that's what's on, uh, you know, and this is what we're supposed to go by. I yeah. mean, and who were the heck were these 12 people to make those kind of decisions for thousands of people? Well, and, and the thing is, where did they get the authority from? That's you right. Know, and obviously, if their authority is coming from Canada, that's a problem. If their authority is coming from the people, which it rarely is, and regardless of whether they got elected or not, that's not where the authority comes from. So, pardon the, 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 <laughs> the phone interruption. It's an occupational hazard. <laughs> but no, it, 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 it is, it, it's really interesting how, how that, that plays out. But one of the things that I, I and I kind of get, get back to a little bit relating to the book and, and Louis Hall is, one of the things that Louis tried to address was what should be the code of conduct. Yeah. You know, he addressed you know, alcoholism and, uh, and uh, you know, bad behavior. And what he crafted as that warrior handbook laid out the responsibilities and yeah. the obligations. And, and, and it wasn't like this, you know, uh, you know, this religious thing that says oh, it's forbidden, it's to do this, it's forbidden to do that. But it talked about responsibility. And, and you didn't need to, to criticize an irresponsible behavior if you already knew that it was, I mean, he didn't have to get into that level yeah. of detail. But I think the whole idea that, that he created, you know, a, a narrative about what most people should, you know, should look to strive to be. You know, in terms he, of the, he was basically saying to everybody, you have a responsibility. You don't just sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. It's your responsibility. You know, the thing is that you can never, ever believe that somebody else is going to do it. You, you as a father, you as a, an uncle, you as a grandfather, you as a brother, uh, you know, a nephew and so on, you know what your responsibilities are because every day of our lives, people are talking about this. They're talking about, uh, you know, the creation. Well, creation, every single day, has been showing you what being responsible is about. That sun rises every morning. That wind is always blowing. The moon appears every night. The stars are there all the time. And that the earth is continuing to, to show you what a mother does. You know, I mean, creation and, and, is and, showing and, you. And the closest thing that any of us have to playing a role in creation is our families. That's right. It, it is the families that we create <laughs> and how we live. So, and Louis talked, he, he connected those things. So we, we understood that, yes, we, we can look at elements of creation and we do call them you know our relatives but we also have that same responsibility That's to our right. own children to our own parents and to our to our spouse yeah. and, and, and all that stuff and and you know and you know and so anybody who wanted to criticize you know and this is the, this is where it got difficult right to criticize the so-called warrior society movement and then you read the read the handbook you say well this is this all makes sense, <laughs> and 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 he, you know, so he wasn't really reinventing things. He was he was kind of stating the obvious, but but it, in terms of putting it down in in words so people understood it, um, I think it 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 did it create it, it created a level of I don't want to say uniformity because we didn't all just conform, no. but we we understood that this is what we strive for. And look, we all have faults, and we all you know we all go through you know the experiences of being influenced from all kinds of other things. But you know the thing is, when I think back to when we were probably the most organized, it was it was guys who had served in military, it was guys who had you know who had worked in all the cities in the United States and Canada. You know, it was all these guys who had all of these other influences, you know, who were, were actually stepping up as the, as the older men in, uh, in this organization. And, and it just goes to show you that they, for all of that worldly experience, better or worse, mm. 
they came back to a place, you know, to uh, to assert, you know, their uh, their responsibilities. Because the thing about you all, uh, you know, like people like Louis and many others, and that one of the things they they really pushed home for a lot of us is that, you know, we're constantly being told, oh, you can't do this, oh, you can't do that, uh, never telling us what we can do. They all just told us that we couldn't do this, and you know, we started to think about this and. You know, and it was true. There is no such thing as you can't. There's no such thing. You will or you won't. You, you Creation gave you a brain. You have the ability to make choices. You have the ability to analyze things. You have the ability to do things. And uh, But the thing is, we're always told, like, uh, let's burn tobacco. You know, I mean, in my lifetime, I've seen tractor, trailer, loads of tobacco burnt, and I didn't see any change. Yeah. The only time I saw anything happen was when our people did it. Well, and this gets into the whole, you know, the Christian influence of prayer uh, yeah. as opposed to, you know, it's like anytime somebody, you know, has a tragedy, it's all oh, my thoughts and prayers. No, I don't need your thoughts and prayers. I might need a hand, though. You know, so I, and you know, and, you know and, and that's not even in our language. No, it isn't. And those, and, those, and I don't know. I hear people from other native territories, and I can't say that it's not in their language. But you, I can't help but but he, hear the Christian influence in some of these other territories when they talk about being so spiritual. I mean, I, you know, and and again, you know, my the work that I do on social media and on these shows, I don't delve into this notion of uh, of spirituality because I think it's. There's such a pragmatic and logical sense to our existence that I don't think you have to take a leap of faith to, uh, to, be, an, uh, to, to be native. I think you only have to understand some of the most basic stuff about, about creation, what our relationships are and that kind of stuff. And, and frankly, that's kind of what Louis you know, had, had put out there in, in, in all of his writings. And it wasn't repetitive. I mean, he wrote you know, literally thousands and thousands of pages you know, of you, stuff. I know, I remember like when I was young and that, uh, Louis used to go see older people. And many times he came to my home to talk to my grandmother and my grandfather and that. And they were all fluent speakers. And, uh, and he would ask them things. And one of the things is, uh, like my grandmother's family, they spoke what we call Uwonagayu. They spoke the old language. And the thing is that when you, when you have this language, and, uh, and people have said it, but uh, sometimes I wonder if they actually uh, see the language. And, uh, because when somebody's talking, you don't just hear them. You see the language. That's the whole point of language is to create the imagery. Yes, yeah. and the thing is that you could see it in your mind. It's like there's a, a movie projector in your head. As they're speaking, it's, it's, it's carrying out. And that, uh, because, like the old people always say, our language is alive. You had na unguawana. It's alive. And that, uh, because you can see it. You don't just hear it. And, uh, and, and that's why today I say, our people, we live in this Yaga society. Yaga. Everything is rumors and gossip. Yagawa, that's what, it's short, Yaga, it's short for Yagawa. It was said, it was said. But the thing is, you didn't hear it with your own ears. You didn't see it with your own eyes. And, that, and when you do hear something, you should make sure you see it as well. Because one confirms the other, then you, can, you know it's the truth. But when it's just said, and there's even a song that talks about lying eyes, you know? <laughs> And that you can't just use your eyes. You have to use your eyes and your ears together and have your brain. Well, and there's a big difference between, up. between hearing something, remembering what you heard, and understanding, yeah. understanding something. Because, you know, when we talk about beliefs, and beliefs are always based on what you were told, but not what you experienced. Because you're, you're told to just believe what I say. Yeah. You know, and, and I know that when, when any time we've talked and we've talked about you know, stuff relating to the culture or some of the, you know, the, the old stories. You, you've always made a point to say, this is the way I understood it when it was told to me. Yeah, and, and this and, is which how is a, I was told. This right. is how I heard it. How you heard it, which yes. is more important than just saying exactly what somebody said. Because yeah. you're, not a rec you're not a tape re recorder. You're, you're saying, this is how I heard it. 
And and if I heard it wrong, oh, at some point somebody's going to, like you say, dissect what See, what I said. And, and that's and what it. our culture. Uh, that's the way our culture is. Is that, you know, like when I was a boy, and that there was this man who always talking like he knows everything. So I was talking to my grandmother about it, and she says, "Don't listen to that man." I say, "Why?" And, uh, and she says, "He thinks he knows everything." I says, "Yeah, well, he knows a lot of things." Yeah, she says, "He might know a lot of things, but the problem he has is he stopped learning." Because when a man says to you, "Look, this is the way I'm going to tell you the way it is," whereas listen to the other old people there say. Let me tell you, let me tell you how I heard it. Let me tell you how it was told to me. Let me tell you my understanding because our culture respected the fact they're going to pass that on, but it's up to you to analyze it. It's up to you to dissect this because in the language, we were always told that Zadore, Oyata, is the body itself. Open it up, split it open, see what's inside. Then you understand why the outside is as it is. That's, mm -hmm. that's what you're told when you're a kid. You know, analyze, really analyze, dissect the matter. Don't accept it just because it was said. Well, and, and you get back to, you know, talking about guys like these theologians and some of these people, yeah. these professors and these, these people who are supposed to be these knowledgeable people. And, and if they stop learning, then they are no longer you know knowledgeable because no. because they you know just like this, this yeah. guy who says he knew it all right or acted like he knew it all you you no longer have somebody that you can interact with yeah. now you're just being dictated to That's and expected right. to take the, everything they say in uh, in its entirety without without questioning it and yeah. and look and i've seen over the years i've seen you know some of these longhouse communities that that refuse to address questions. They refuse to address anybody who questions some of what you know what has been put out there as our culture or our ways. And, and, and we hear people say that all the time. And, and they're told. Yeah. They their answer when they're asked a question is, if you knew your language, you wouldn't be asking a stupid question. If you knew, you attended the ceremonies more, you wouldn't ask a stupid question. Well, what's the point? And yet, and yet, you I, go to longhouse. Only these few people are speaking the language, but they won't break it down so you could understand. They just tell and, you, this is how this is performed. And those guys cannot even do a Guyanardo Goa recital. No, they can't. They can't even do it. And, and I've been to what they, what they called some of them, and they really talk more about what they don't know than what they do know. Right. And they say, oh, we're just doing the best we can. So you're not really doing anything. Yeah. You know, when, when a few years back, when, when you were part of a group that tried to analyze a weekend discussion about uh, the Gallinero Goa, not not a recital, but a dis but an open yeah. discussion, that was more informative than any of the these these so-called recitals because they they aren't doing recitals, and you know, and these are the guys who will be the first one to tell you, you know, that if you knew if you followed the culture, you would know these things. Well, if they follow the culture, they would know these things too. The but, thing is, you have to always address the question somebody has. Yeah, because when somebody asks you a question. And you explain to them the, the best of your ability, uh, what your understanding is. It leads to other questions, and that and that's the thing you want. You want the people's minds working. You know, like sometimes they say, "Oh, you got to have a good mind." And if you question these so-called leaders, "Oh, you don't have a good mind." I say that's wrong. But the thing is, to me, Gatnigo Rio, and that Gatnigo Rio is a mind that works, mm -hmm. not a mind that is being worked. Yeah, yeah, you see. Well, and and I think the the whole idea of when you're asked a question that that you may not know fully the answer to, you can offer your your thoughts on on how you view um, addressing that question. But you always encourage people to 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 seek out others That's and, right. and to and to find out more because you know you you talk about this all the time. We 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 say now our minds are one, but it's it's really that we've taken the best parts of every one of our minds to yeah. so we can come to one mind or, 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 or like or mind a like Come mind on, right. like mind because you can't be a one you can't be one mind no we're all going to harbor some things back there but say you know this has been the best conclusion we can get from all of that everybody contributed right. and that's that's what makes strength mm -hmm. as we are able mm -hmm. as we are able and uh, and the thing is we could make a decision today 
as a people. But we're going to learn new things. Mm -hmm. And nothing is engraved in stone. And that uh, we can always change things. We have the power to change things, to make things better. We have that power. You know, don't, you know the, some of these old stories, I mean, we're told just to accept it. Yeah. You, no. We question it. Well, and, and look, we... We have a tremendous amount of tools at our, dispo at our disposal today. I mean, look, we're doing this recording and, and we, we have the ability to, to broadcast and we have the ability to put stuff out there. We have um, more tools for teaching today than certainly Louis had you yeah. know, a, a, during his day. And, you know, and oftentimes we're inundated with misinformation and disinformation. You know, that's one of the more common things that gets talked about in the American political system and the Canadian political system, because there's so many goddamn liars out there. And, you know, but for us, we we have the ability to re reach out to people. And and I think, you know, doing the best we can with the knowledge that that has still been maintained by, you know, Push, put forward by guys like Louis Hall and, and yourself and so many others that, that, you know, frankly, if they had frequent flyer miles for all the miles you've put on your trucks over the years, uh, you, you'd be traveling for free for the rest of your life. But it's, you know, this is, that's just it. We, we do have the ability to, to, uh, to use some of this technology. Not to get lost in it, but to, but to, to use it to, to teach. And, you know, again, I'm, and I'm glad, you know, I, I'm glad that Matt and Malik and, and, and Philip and these guys took enough interest in not only in Gunawage and, and Akwasasne, uh, and, and I met these guys in New York for, before they even traveled up, up north, uh, and I had a chance to talk with some of these guys, and, um, and I knew what they were interested in. They saw, in, just like Louis did, Louis studied so much of what was happening around the world, and these guys were seeing what was happening around the world and how this was happening right in essentially our backyard. It wasn't just in, in Palestine. It wasn't just in Africa. Yeah. It wasn't in just these Asian or South American countries that some of these, uh, this oppression was happening. It was happening right here. And, you know, so you know, meeting these guys and then and having them take enough of a commitment and, and from the very start, whether you're talking about uh, Sogoyeta or, or yourself or, and, and the conversation that I had, they became very aware of, of the work that Louis Hall did. And of course, the flag that Louis designed, which was designed as a unity flag, just became this most iconic image um, for essentially native resistance. It may not have been built specifically for that, but it was about unifying. And that's what, you know, I know that's what Louis was, that is probably the, what most people know Louis as, as the, as the designer of, uh, of that unity flag slash warrior flag. But you know, one of the things that you talked about, the psychological warfare, Louis said he had no problem with this idea that they were going to, you know, redefine it as a warrior flag and they were going to define us as warriors rather than, rather than the British Scarf I get it. I mean, the, the fact that he, he said, look, use it. And, you know, and I remember <laughs> you telling me the story about printing all of those, uh, yeah. the original logos the, the designed for the warrior society on those, uh, look, they were on those nylon jackets. They were on like uh, Letterman's jeans jackets, jeans. jean jackets. And, Everybody wanted one, and so it, it really woke up the non-native public and government to say, wow, this warrior society has really grown. You know, a lot of these guys are just wearing jackets. <laughs> but uh, You see, because at the time when we rekindled our fire, there was only seven of us. And before that, we were, we were just a singing society. And uh, by learning all the things we did from the older ones and that, and we said to ourselves, Let's rekindle that with this going to get the fire. Yeah. And, uh, and so in the discussions and that, the word warrior came in in that. And the thing is, so we asked God because he had made us a logo as a singing group. Mm -hmm. Now we wanted one as Rudy's going to get there. And so he does this and it's beautiful. So, ah, So what's called it? So we went to the printers and uh, we wanted seven of these crests. And the printer says, for a few dollars more, you can get 200 of them. We thought, oh, geez, that's not How are we going to do with 200 of them? <laughs> yeah, well, what are we going to do? Well, we'll have spares, you yeah. know? But when we put it on our jacket, every young person wanted one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we talked about it and said, what are we going to do? Do we sell it to them? What are we going to do? Let's give it to them. We gave it to them and all of a sudden, 
everybody believes now, look at all these warriors. <laughs> and that, because it wasn't just guys, it was girls too, you know. Everybody wanted this crest, you know, and that, because it gives people a sense of pride. Well, and, and, and again, when identity has been something that's been obliterated because of residential schools and even the schools within the community, the churches in our community, this was uh, a, a, a sense, a way of reclaiming our identity. Yeah. You know, look, we're, we're almost done with this, uh, with this program. And I do want to, again, mention that we, we are going to New York um, on May 2nd uh, for the book launch of Mohawk, the Mohawk Warrior Society, a handbook on sovereignty and survival. Um, we've all participated, a bunch of us have participated, and those who have participated are going to try to make it to New York. So it's going to be an opportunity to meet some of the people behind it, uh, behind some of what's in the book, um, and talk about it. The, the book is available on Amazon. You can search, again, the Mohawk Warrior Society. If you just search that, you'll, you'll get the subtitle there. Um, it's available on, uh, you know, on, uh, on Amazon and, and probably other places as well. So I encourage people to, to get the book. Um, if you're in the New York City area, and we'll see what we can capture in terms of imagery or even some videos of the, of the event. And maybe I'll, I'll get a chance to post some of that stuff when, when the time is right. But um, I also want to remind people that, uh, you know, that uh, this is Resistance Radio. Uh, we're, we're grateful for the airtime that were provided by WBAI in New York City and in, uh, um, by WPFW in, uh, in Washington, D.C., I do want to encourage people to support those radio stations. So if you're listening in New York, I hope that you will uh, write this down and, and keep in mind that they have a pledge line, 212-209-2950, or go online to give to WBAI.org. That's for WBAI. Uh, if you're in Washington, D.C., you know, or if you're listening online, however you listen, um, and you want to support that radio station, WPFW, Jazz and Justice Radio in D.C., go to 202-588-9739 or go online to WPFWDC.org slash donate. Um, again, um, this is, you know, it kind of exciting for me because I haven't been to New York in, in literally since, the, since March of 2020. That's how long it's been. So it's been three years. Uh, and that's, you know, a trip that I was making every week to New York City. So... Um, it's going to be interesting to see just how much the landscape has changed since then. But um, uh, I do look forward to, to meeting some people. I hope some of the folks who listen to this show, especially in New York, will, will come out and uh, do a little bit of a meet and greet and, and get a chance to meet some of the folks that, uh, that have influenced me uh, in such a big way. Um, I'd just like to mention something. This book, the author of this book, he, he's not getting anything out of this. And uh, it's this money that generated from the book sales and all that stuff, that's all going to what we have as called the Louis Howe Foundation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, the money will all be used for educational. Uh, we hope to build uh, a sort of um, a higher learning center. And uh, not a museum, but a place where people can go and learn more about who we really are. And uh, instead of just going to libraries and, uh, and things like that, but to get to know who we are, we want to we wanna create an institute for higher learning and uh, based on who we are and what we're about and, uh, and not somebody else trying to dictate who we are. And, and, and this has been a long-term goal. Yes. This, this book is just you know, one of the things that, uh, that we've had the opportunity to participate in and, and had good support in getting done. But it, uh, there's a lot to be learned from the book. Uh, and you will be contributing to, to learning beyond the book. So, again, uh, you come out and support, uh, support this book, support the project, and, uh, and hopefully we'll see some of you at the, at the book launch on, on May 2nd. I want to thank you for listening. This is John Kane with Paul Delaron de Garundege, um, and this is Resistance Radio. <laughs>